Okay, let's move on to Mikhail Anufriev. He's going to address um, recommendations uh, four and seven. I suspect he's mainly going to focus on seven because four is sh we should have a, a transparent reporting regime and I don't imagine there's many arguments against that. I mean, uh, I guess that's one of those no-brainers, I would suspect. But anyway, over to Mikhail. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Ross, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to show a little bit of ongoing research, and I would like to thank CIFAR actually for sponsoring me, for funding this research. This research with Valentin Panchenko, who is here from UNSW, and Paolo Pin from University of uh, Siena. In fact, and indeed, two recommendations I have to address, they are here. So recommendation four asks for improvement in data reporting. Uh, everybody would be happy to see that. I, I, I was actually surprised to see the motivation for this. The motivation is that in order to show everybody around the world how good Australian banks are. So it is as if, if the capital requirements of Australia, if the capital ratios of Australian bank would be bad, we would not like to make this uh, transparent uh, reporting. I think it is important, and in fact, in our uh, experience of working with data, we found that it, we would really be very glad if that could be implemented. Um, and second, uh, second recommendation I'm going to approach is recommendation seven. That's about uh, introducing a leverage ratio in addition to the minimum capital requirement, uh, which uh, as a, as a requirement uh, may be less prone to some specific choice of risk, risk measures by the bank. So it has to be used as a backstop to uh, risk-weighted capital positions of the bank. When I read uh, the report, I was actually pleased how well it is written. I think it's very uh, nice work. Many people already said that it takes into account different uh, balances and it really speaks a lot about incentives, moral hazards, but what I uh, recognize that while the idiosyncratic risk, risks of certain parties are taken into account, the systemic risk is not. It is mentioned, I think, thousands of times, but maybe not to the extent as I would like to see there. So what is systemic risk? As uh, we probably understand, systemic risk is the risk that a, a substantial part of the system will be collapsing or stop functioning. It may be caused by, roughly speaking, two uh, forces. One theory says that it might be due to the domino effect, but if to use car analogy, uh, you may think about the cars which are dumping into each other one after another. Uh, popcorn theory, on the other hand, and I leave it to you to imagine how the popcorn is uh, you know, prepared, but uh, using car analogy is when the cars are independently of each other stuck to the road because of some uh, fails in, in their uh, systems. Um, which one of these theories is uh, important uh, for the systemic risk? Probably domino theory looks like more appealing, uh, and I'm going to look more on that. I'm going to talk about leverage, and that's related to this recommendation seven, because it's one of possible mechanisms of contagion. It's only one, but probably most intuitive. Uh, and uh, recommendation four is related to the systemic risk because as a consequence of taking them into account, we would like to evaluate uh, losses of the system and identify systemically important financial institutions. And for this, of course, transparency in reporting and more detailed reporting in particular about inter uh, uh, financial institutions uh, credit borrowing relationship uh, is important. Okay, so the Past research, and I must say that in the last five years, the research on systemic risk, of course, blossomed. Uh, past research identified that we don't have to be worried too much about this domino theory. There's not much, I mean, theoretically, number of conditions uh, should be met, and it's not always, it doesn't seem that it's plausible that they will be met at the same time. In empirics, it also doesn't seem that most of the systems are, uh, so fragile against this uh, domino theory. But nevertheless, I think that the research shows that yes, domino theory may amplify uh, whenever failures happen in the system. The effect of this amplification does depend on financial connectivity and therefore one has to look at the financial connectivity of the system. Uh, 
especially it becomes a problem in particular if financial institutions inflate their balance sheet by increasing leverage. Uh, yes, it typically requires some extra channels to propagate this domino effect, uh, but it might be that these channels may suddenly appear and then it becomes, uh, it becomes crucial. So uh, I, despite this uh, relatively low relevance of s domino theory empirically at this moment, I don't think that this should be uh, ignored. Let me show you some simple examples. So here you see seven banks. Uh, they are represented by balance sheet. Usually uh, what I learned is that left hand side is the assets, right hand side is the li liabilities. And then you see here the difference between them by definition, that is equity or capital. Now what you see here, that number of uh, mm, borrowing lending relation are established between bank. For example, this first bank borrowed actually some part of funding from the second bank. And by the second bank borrowed something from the bank three and so on. And so let's suppose that in this situation, in this case, bank one uh, got some a bad negative shock, which means one of its loans was non-performing. Uh, it's relatively large one, and you see this is larger actually than equity, and so this equity doesn't work as a cushion in this case. Bank is in this situation is insolvent, and what it must do, it must also uh, default by some of its obligations. Maybe partially, maybe completely, like we assume here as an extreme case. So if this shock would be in the system where this bank is alone, then that probably would be the end of the story. But because of this interconnectivity, we see that now banks two, three, and four are also having non-performing loans. Uh, bank, three is bank two is already insolvent. Bank three seems like okay, because that loan was fortunately not as large as the equity. However, think about this bank two. Now, because bank two is insolvent and it also borrowed something from bank three, the cascade propagates. So you see the point, the point is this one uh, event, negative event, negative shock for one bank in this interconnected system uh, may propagate through. This is an example of systemic risk through uh, propagated th th through the uh, borrowing lending relationship. Now how to quantify this or how to measure it? Uh, here I refer to the recent paper in publishing Journal of Banking and Finance uh, where the authors proposed some uh, rough framework for evaluating it. And what we have done, we applied this to uh, Australian banks and I will show you the exercise, uh, the results of this exercise in a moment. What they show here, if you translate it uh, from mathematical language is that what is important or what, what may lead to this domino effect are two things. First, one of the institutions, the one who receives the shock, should have high contagion index. And second is that those institutions which will be in the second wave of the shock will be affected if the, uh, they should have low average outside assets. So just to explain it, contagion index of the institution is just, you may think as a product of equity, financial connectivity, which is the proportion of liabilities to other financial entities, and inverse of the outside uh, leverage. So if you think here, this bank number one, this bank number one had a number of uh, liabilities uh, to other financial institutions, and so it actually had high level of financial connectivity. So this thing will be high. And also its uh, shock uh, was relatively high with respect to the equity, which basically means that it has low leverage with res leverage ratio with respect to outside assets. So this first bank met the requirement that this contagion index is high. And then all other banks, they were connected from that banks because they had a relatively large part of their balance sheet and assets related inside of the same system. And so they had actually a low average outside assets. This condition met. And when this condition met is exactly when this domino effect may propagate and may cause even higher uh, losses or higher probability as well uh, of these losses than direct uh, shocks from the popcorn theory. Uh, when we look at the data, uh, we did some data analysis. So first of all, uh, this is the graph from 
the data based on the upper website. Upper website have some statistics of the balance sheet, but it's only partial parts of the balance sheet, only selected items are there and only for basically domestic operations. And if you look at this, uh, you see, you, so what is nice in that data that we could go back until 2004. Uh, here we assume that INZ, so we have selected INZ, well I selected INZ because I have money there. Uh, mm, <laughs> that's the only reason. Uh, and we assume that this, INZ, this is very unlikely I think, but we, let's assume that INZ fails. And let's see through this balance sheet whether we can ac ac assess the possibility of this domino effect. So what is plotted here is the ratio of uh, the right hand side to the left hand side. And so when this ratio is less than one, then it means that the propagation is possible and plausible. Uh, number one is here. And as you see in this graph, most of the relatively large banks, Suncorp, Macquarie, Bendigo, they are safe. They are safe because they are above than one. They would not uh, fail as a consequence of this wave if INZ would fail. But some small banks may. Okay, well, look at this plot and notice that in the past several years, this, uh, this actually index, this uh, ratio goes down. Okay, that's interesting. I, in fact, it also went down for most of these banks before the crisis, then it some, for some reason went up. I'm not Australian and I was not in Australia in that time, but looking at this, I would expect that banks would do something. Uh, I don't know, some, some restructurization or something. But now it again goes down. So now why it goes down? If it goes down for all banks, maybe with INZ there is a problem. Let's look on INZ then. And th now we have to look in some other balance sheet, which is actually better. It has all assets now. It's a balance sheet from INZ website and also we build it for other big four and also for Bindigo just to have uh, some small bank, relatively small bank there. And what we do, do here, we compute those contagion index. That is, the, if it is high, then it means that this bank may cause this type of, of wave. Well, they are relatively high because of course it's also proportional to the equity, so it's not a big problem. I think it's interesting to see, actually to look in the tendency. And when you look in this tendency, you indeed see that INZ, for example, goes uh, higher and higher, so it has higher and higher contagion index. If you d dig a little bit deeper, then you find that that's because INZ has somewhat increased financial connectivity. So overall, the except NAP, which actually goes down, the uh, our fast uh, calculation and our fast look at the data suggests that uh, financial connectivity of an Australian Big Four are growing in the past years. And we know that it may be a, a kind of problem at some bad times. So I think that regulators also should have a look at that uh, types of uh, measures or issues. Okay, so that brings me back to the recommendation. Recommendation four was about a template. Now I showed you three plots. Two of them were for different data sets, different balance sheet. Uh, we check them, they do not coincide with each other sometimes, and we can understand why. We also have a confidential data set from APRA where we can make much more detailed analysis, but uh, it would take a number of months to get an approval to show you something, so we decided to not use it now in this uh, talk. The, the problem, however, that it also doesn't coincide with those numbers. The second problem is that those numbers, confidential numbers, they are in the number, so that's basically a form where the financial institutions should report their largest exposures. They write the counterparty in this free text format. And so the same bank could be, met, uh, could be written in very different ways. It actually took for us about half of a year to clean this data set and it looks like nobody ever done it before. So I think the better transparency or better reporting, that's actually an important thing. It would uh, definitely make our life as researchers easier and we could show you much more interesting plots then probably. So I, I think that the recommendation four is very sensitive. I also think the recommendation seven is good because indeed, as you saw, the leveraging uh, of the, ins the high leveraging of the institution uh, makes it actually kind of simpler to, to propagate this type of, uh, of small shocks. Uh, the, and capital requirements, which would already have a, some minimum uh, setup, 
may not be enough, exactly because uh, financial institutions could use uh, several risk-weighted procedures in order to uh, kind of undermine that, uh, that requirements. And because these are typically large institutions that are systemically important institution, this problem may actually jeopardize the whole system. Leverage as a backstop is also a good idea because, in fact, you can imagine uh, in that example that if uh, the balance sheet of the some institution goes down and then it has a problem with leverage, and meets these leverage requirements, it stacks there. Uh, if this bank should do something, it would have no other alternative than actually decrease his balance sheet, and that would be bad in the bad times. So I think as a uh, backstop, as I understand this word, uh, means not too strict in a sense. So, and I think that's a good uh, point. That's all what I wanted to say about these recommendations. I would also like to use, if I have uh, one uh, minutes or 30 seconds to uh, advertise uh, recent work which we have done with Valentin. Uh, that's also under CIFR grant and it's actually uh, a network of dependence of different sectors and you see the banks here but also different sectors of Australia based on the public opinion because what we s draw here, we draw the network on the basis of correlations of, of indices, of, of returns. So we call it perceived network. And again, if you look a little bit on the time perspective, what we observe is that the financial sector gets more connected. And these are so-called partial correlations. So it means that we wash out all the effects of the remaining system for any relationship between any two entities. So if you see here a large link, it, for example, between NUB and INZ, it means that somehow in the returns, they are moving in the same direction, even if you wash out all the effects of other risks, so of other, of other sectors. And so it's really something idiosyncratic for them. Okay, so let me stop uh, here at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mikhail, indeed. But, um, okay, over to the audience. We have, now don't forget, we also have uh, three, three other people up here. We have Dr. Valentin Penchenko from the Economics Faculty at UNSW. We have Dr. Alden Tobbs, who has the very small job of managing all the risk for the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. And we have Aidan O'Shaughnessy, head of uh, policy for Australian Bankers Association. So feel th free to throw questions at the entire panel or to suggest who you may want to uh, address your questions. I've, I'll, I'll lead off with one question, which is for Alden, which is, is he sitting there looking at all that wonderful maths thinking that he wants to give Mikhail a job? Or, uh we, we are hiring in analytics, so uh, take our resumes as, as uh, you might wish. Uh, there's a deficiency of, of a good um, a practical analytic uh, resource in Australia, so we'd be pleased to hear about any capabilities in that regard. On a more serious note, would you like to head off, uh, kick it off yourself with some comments on well, questions uh, on other people's? Um, I'll make an observation maybe to start. The, um, uh, I thought all the presentations were good um, and uh, thoughtful additions to the um, material that is in the FSI. And the FSI, as uh, Wayne Byer said, uh, was a balanced and, and, and good report. So I think we're dealing with important matters here, um, well articulated, uh, well developed, and uh, ready for uh, further consultation and debate, which is exactly where we should be. Um, what the, the uh, Probably the most important of the issues uh, to the Commonwealth Bank, so I would start with that, is a combination of the capital and uh, disclosure, the transparency. Um, we, like other large banks, are a major funder uh, through um, foreign markets, in, in part, uh, because of the um, uh, the way in which the current account deficit works in Australia. We are uh, an expanding nation with uh, insufficient money to support the development of this economy and its, and its resource base. Now that can change as it's quieting down and so forth, but, but for many, many years, um, Australia has depended upon the financial services industry to finance a significant part of the growth of Australia. Um, may, um, that means that we have to take our individual bank stories to the financial markets overseas and, and get them to um, believe as much as they will believe about 
our financial strength and believe the appropriateness uh, or actually set the, the interest rate uh, that they will charge for our debt. Um, interestingly, um, until recently, there's been a juxtaposition of two very odd things. Um, a, and this is not a go at APRA, but it will sound like it for a moment, but, but forgive the transition to a higher point. Um, APRA has justifiably um, increased the financial strength of, of commercial banks uh, quite notably, and although the nature of the global financial crisis was not uh, centered down here, it certainly had a glancing blow that was pretty damn scary. So I can tell you, uh, sitting um, uh, after Lehman uh, Brothers uh, crisis uh, as a new chief risk officer of the Commonwealth Bank and trying to figure out what does it really mean for us was a pretty confronting thing. It turns out it was a glancing blow. But um, the financial markets internationally did not believe it was a glancing blow for many, many months because they couldn't tell. Um, the financial strength of all the major banks at that time are probably 60 per, 60 only 60 percent of what they are today. Um, what was interesting, though, is at that time as well as today, the way in which APRA makes the calculations for the amount of capital that we disclose is idiosyncratically odd to the rest of the uh, many other countries, and particularly the rest of the world on average. So if I were to take today, uh, the reported capital number for the major banks in Australia is somewhere in the mid eights to low nine percent. There are a number of deductions um, or carve outs that lowers the appearance of that capital ratio. And so if we were to take uh, the bank regimes, the, the banks here and put them in any other regulatory regime, Europe, Canada, uh, the UK, Singapore, um, as examples, what would be shown for our capital ratios would be something more like 11 to 14 percent, even though we show mid eights to low nines. Now you can say, well, uh, capital doesn't matter, but I guarantee you that when you're trying to raise debt and, and you're saying, now trust us, the nine is really 13. Um, and you're sitting across the table from, let's take a, a, a big investor in, in um, foreign investor in, in uh, bank stocks, Fidelity. You're seeing uh, a group of mid 20 year old uh, bank analysts who are deciding whether to buy your bills and bonds, short dated bonds. And you're saying, trust us, we're really 13%, but here's how you have to make the calculation and it's a 14 step process. They're going, no, I don't care. So there's. If there's ever a, de a demonstration of financial market inefficiency where information uh, is not fully recognized, you only have to sit in one of those meetings to say it just gets too hard, way too fast to what financial theory would suggest. Now, fortunately, um, but it did take some work, but it came right. APRA has said, uh, rather than hiding, in a sense, the capital number, the, the true capital strength underneath some sort of opaque, this thing as opposed to this thing, we will actually work to make it more disclosed and therefore more comparable. Therefore, when people have to make relative investment decisions, they don't have to go through a 14 step process to equilibrate um, our capital number to uh, the Royal Bank of Canada, for example, or JP Morgan, et cetera. Um, so a combination of uh, recognizing the way in which capital is calculated recognizing the strength, meaning the conservative nature of the capital calculations in Australia, and disclosing them has been a very important um, procedural process that's come right through the financial services inquiry to the benefit not only of the banks that I've been talking about, but also to the economy because we will have a fairer go in terms of uh, absorption of quite necessary capital to support the um, the economy of Australia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, over to the floor. The audience has to work harder for this. You've all got these wonderful um, mics in front of you. Just drag one up and press the button until it lights up. <laughs> 
while you are thinking about it, I'll ask Ian Patterson a question. Um, you talk about the tier three capital. Aren't the Australian banks, I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but aren't they already issuing hybrid bonds and aren't they sort of doing that job? Uh, well, the, the, uh, the we're is issuing Basel III compliant regulatory capital, which is tier one, that's effectively preference shares, uh, and tier two, which is dated subordinated debt. But what people are talking about when they talk about either tier three or TLAC uh, is to say that in addition to that, we could have a class of senior bond, which the holders agree in certain circumstances gets converted to equity or written off, similar to the regulatory capital instruments, but because you've, you're a senior bondholder, you want to have an outcome that is better than what you would have uh, uh, had if you had agreed to uh, buy a uh, subordinated bond or a, or a preference share. interrupt there and make the point that um, James made the point about dividend imputation. One of the consequences of that is for Australian banks, preference shares are in a sense as good as debt because there's no double taxation of, of the dividends, whereas overseas, no one's, almost no one's got imputation. Therefore, all the discussion about contingent capital is in terms of debt instruments, which is sort of silly from our perspective. Uh, and I don't know whether that sort of point has got into the international debate it all seems to be in terms of, of debt instruments. Yeah, look, the, the only comment I'd make on that is that, look, uh, f first I agree, our taxation rules are very different to everybody else's rules. We will treat a, a, a preference share of the kind that's tier one as, as tax equity, and that's why they tend to be issued here in Australia and, uh, and pay for bankable distributions. Uh, in overseas jurisdictions, however, they will actually treat, certain uh, jurisdictions will treat preference shares as tax debt, at least if they are um, uh, um, uh, sort of qualifying regulatory capital. So that's what the UK does, and so that creates a, uh, uh, if, if we're doing um, tax efficient tier one because it's frank, I can assure you that overseas people are doing tax efficient tier one because it's, uh, they're getting a, a deduction on the coupon. Maybe, maybe a chime in as well. There, there are a couple of observations here. One, one is kind of a special case that's kind of interesting for, for maybe somebody up here on the panel or in the audience to study, and that is the Reserve Bank of New Zealand has a um, bailing structure that they passed a while ago, and, and it's, a, it's a pretty unusual and probably not particularly well thought through, honestly, uh, called the Open Bank Resolution, where even the depositors of the bank uh, can be tipped in with a particular predetermined haircut. So they did, they predetermined haircuts, uh, which sort of sounds like creating some certainty of uncertainty, if you will, but also at the same time, um, we, we as bankers worry that uh, any haircut of a depositor, given normal pre presumption of depositor preference, will create many runs in the case of uh, banks that begin to get um, uh, weaken there and sort of precipitate um, because of the potential of that, the stated potential of that, uh, maybe some, some movement. I was taken as well um, uh, by Ian, some of your comments uh, in terms of, and, and um, uh, uh, someone else made the, oh, uh, Chair, you, uh, on the, um, the issue if we ever get into these circumstances there's gonna be a big bun fight in the courts before it all gets settled, no matter how much um, you try to predefine. And uh, when you add that, well, we're in favor of, of bail-ins, but in a sort of restricted way, as clearly defined as possible to sort of minimize this chance, nonetheless there will be that. There will also be the, the issue of once you've bailed somebody in, one of these structures in, it pretty well taints that market for a new issuance. So basically, it's, it's a kind of a one-trick um, event, if you will, a potentially one-trick event because the next person who needs to raise capital and has to ha a, a grow uh, with a structure that would be somewhat similar to the one that just got built in is gonna have a very hard time using that structure because it's a tainted structure. Just a, a big question, if we can step back for a minute. Why does banking as an industry, and Aidan, you might want to have a go at this, or Alden, or whoever, uh, why does banking as an industry run on such slim capital levels? I mean, I, I take the point the real capital levels of Australian banks are probably at 
But, you know, a lot of industries run with a lot more capital than that. The 14% risk range too. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, um, the, 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 you have to look at the risk content of the balance sheet um, in order to answer that question. So if the, if the, the balance sheet is reasonably well-founded, you have a different leverage requirement than if it's a very risky one. And if you take a corporation, which would maybe be 30% uh, um, uh, equity funded, and you look at the idiosyncratic <coughs> nature of the risks, of, of that as well as the systemic uh, nature of the risk of that and compare that to the banks and do stress tests on both. Um, uh, the, the presumption is that these capital ratios through um, not only the regulatory community, even as it's somewhat discredited because of the amount of capital that leverage that was allowed in the system uh, until fairly recently, but now as it works hard to, to develop the new capital ratios that would be consistent with the risk content of balance sheets. They're not seeing uh, the need for, and they're protecting a depositor base. They're not uh, seeing the need for uh, um, deleveraging to, this, to the extent that it would look like more of a, a, a modern industrial. Uh, they just don't see the risk content, and the banks don't see the risk content of the balance sheet uh, uh, as being uh, so large as to warrant that level of capital. If I may add uh, yeah, to this, please, please. Well, I, I guess it just in the core function of the banking sector to turn the deposits into the liabilities and the banking sector supposedly has uh, enough expertise uh, to do the right decision with the deposits which are brought to the banking system. So it's it just the intermediary essentially between investors, uh, uh, household investors who don't understand much about how business should be structured and more risky businesses where banks use their expertise to invest too. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's uh, uh, banking is inherently highly leveraged. That's, that, that's what the business model is uh, really, really is for. You have the fixed liabilities which are turning into loans. Uh, and so you're, you're naturally going to be much more highly geared than, uh, than an industrial company, and that, that shows in things like, you know, thin capitalization ratios for financial uh, institutions like banks are one number, whereas for industrials, they're, you know, uh, they're another. Uh, but I think there is, um, certainly the lower you run it, the greater the risks that you introduce into the, the, in the, into the system. Okay. If I could add to that as well, it just, it just the, the long-term historical trend towards greater leverage in banking that's occurred over 100 or 150 years of more seems to be connected in some way with this natural tension between competitive forces um, and, um, and, 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 and um, efficient, efficiency and, and, st and stability and, and, and competitive forces. And it just seems that part of the business model for banks is being able to fund themselves cheaply and if there is even very small effects um, through the tax system or through implicit guarantees, which in terms of basis points look really very small, but perhaps in, with, with um, um, you know, alternative um, lending models, um, shadow banking, um, other forms of financing, um, together with whatever competition exists within the banking sector itself, those competitive forces um, kind of drive um, cost savings wherever they might be available and however small they, they might apparently be. And I was actually going to pick up on the first point. I mean, the, the, the argument that banks are somehow different to industrial companies um, may or may not be true, but if you go right back into history, uh, you know, in the 1800s, um, banks typically had capital ratios very high. I mean, the Australian banks had assets, had equity to assets. So this is not e equity to risk weighted assets. This is just a straight leverage ratio uh, in the before 1900s of over 20%. Um, they also had, uh, I think it was double liability or unlimited liability for the, for the shareholders. So there's something happened 
over the course of, and one of your co-authors has written about this as well, I think, uh, Alden, um, George Kaufman at various times. You know, something's clearly happened. Because I, I don't think you would necessarily say that, you know, that, well, maybe banking's got more risky, but that would work any other, other way. Um, but, you know, if you look back in the history, uh, you know, banks had very high capital ratios. And, I mean, my gut feel um, is, and I think there's a lot of people would say that it's, it comes down to the existence of prudential regulators, of government, government guarantees and so on, that enables banks to operate with much lower, lower ratios. Be before you jump in and, 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 uh, and uh, tear me down there, Alan, um, one other point I, just, I, I think it's worth putting on the table. Uh, in the discussion about the contingent capital, uh, Australian banks actually had a sort of contingent capital up until about 1961, I think it was. So if you look at the, the bank balance sheets, they actually had uncalled equity on their balance sheet. Uh, up until about 61 for the, the major banks was about equal to the amount of equity that it actually had been called. And some of it was actually called a, 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 a I, don't think, I don't think it was a resilience reserve, <laughs> something like a, a, a recovery reserve or a, a re um, forget the term now. But so yeah, these were so partly paid shares, were they? They were, they were not partly paid, they were um, callable shares. Sorry, Alden, sorry. I. Well, it's, um, I don't mean to be now defending the industry uh, on leverage and so forth, but a couple of other points related on leverage. Um, there, there is a um, forces that work in the international community that would say the leverage, everything's too hard, therefore a leverage, simple leverage test, somewhere around six, eight, uh, ten percent is the right thing to do. Um, uh, that strikes me as being um, uh, really uninsightful and um, in reaction to uh, the fact that uh, the, the regulatory community has not really helped contain um, many banks from having close calls if not uh, defaults. Um, but it's interesting that the places where the Basel frameworks were um, sort of more instituted and there's a little bit of a run on it simply had a much better time, even though it was Basel II, with some limitations to what Basel III or IV will be. Um, they, they, the, the enforcement of a Basel frame, an advanced Basel framework in um, banking economies, generally speaking, have a high correlation with places that didn't have a lot of problem, and no, most notably Canada, sitting right on top of the cesspool that was my home country's financial services sector. Um, and they came through uh, comparatively fine because they were risk weighting and understanding the risks and capitalizing those things by comparison to their southern brethren in, to a considerable extent. Um, so good prudential regulation, which Canada d does have, very comparable to um, uh, Australia, coupled with risk-weighted uh, considerations as opposed to blunt capitalization tools is correlated, causation to be, to, be, to be determined over time, but it is correlated with better banking outcomes than many other countries that didn't have e both of those good supervisory-oriented prudential authorities with good risk-weighting of uh, the risk content of bank balance sheets. Okay, very good. Aidan, what's the Bankers Association take on the report? Are there things you're particularly thrilled with? Are you disappointed you're not allowed to have 3% capital? I mean, what is the... <laughs> um, look, I, actually, the, the Bankers Association is very, very supportive of the report. I think it's... The good thing about Australia is that... Can you hear me? The good thing about Australia is that the governments here do these types of analysis when it's not a time of crisis. So the FSI was this year, and next year is going to be hopefully the tax reform, looking at the entire regime and how it actually, we can improve it for the next 20 years. So if you look at the FSI recommendations, you'll see um, the whole way through the Bankers Association, members have been very, very supportive of it. It actually does set us up for the next decade, the next two decades. So when you look at the principles of you know, what's in the best interest of the economy. The FSI, FSI report says, you know, there are no large scale issues we have here. There's nothing systemic, no systemic problems, but there are a number of areas where we can actually improve. 
and lead us into the future. So uh, the, the ABA was very, very supportive of that. The resilience and what we're talking about today, um, it's very much what Wayne said and what, what Alden said. Uh, the FSI recommendations and what's happening on the international sphere are very much on a parallel path. So I think the questions posed um, in the FSI report will be answered in due course within the next within the next year. I think what's important um, is that APRA, if you look at the recommendations in the FSI, it's they're saying APRA should. So they're very much focused at APRA. So APRA should have some level of discretion about how it actually implements to achieve the objective of recommendations one to eight because it is a very much, it's a, it's a moving feast. There's no other way to describe it. Now, obviously, um, I think unquestionably strong. The banks will welcome unquestionably strong. It, it was a good thing that during the global financial crisis that we were viewed as unquestionably strong and that should con continue. I think capital is only one measure of that. There is obviously the quality of prudential regulation and other factors within the Basel framework. Um, the, the risk weightings in the, in, the, in the mortgage books, I think you'll see within the next year, uh, the, the work on the Basel committee will have it will actually result in that recommendation being resolved somehow. So there's two options that the um, advanced banks uh, hold more capital or the standard, standard banks hold less capital. I think the flavor internationally is that there is a preference for banks to hold more capital. So I think you'll see that, that, that problem being resolved that way. I go back to what Alden said about the, um, the transparency in reporting. I know he, he represented um, the CBA view on that, but it is very much the same view across all our membership. It is when we go out into the, into the wholesale market to our investors, it is very hard for us to say, this is how we report to APRA, this is what is accepted, but in reality, comparing us to these other jurisdictions, these other banks, this is what we are. The equity analysts just don't get it. You, you, you do need the, the quant analysts to look at it and go, yes, that's right. But by that time, the sale is done and the money is sold to, to, to another investor. So it is very important that that work be done. And APRA, um, and, and I know the industry have actually started work on it. Um, but I've, the, the direction we're going now, we're actually hitting um, areas where we're saying, well, what will we compare against? What's the cohort? What do we need to look at? What, what do we need to compare against? And how does that look? How does that comparability look? Um, I think the view at the moment, my personal view is that comparing us to the, the minimum Basel framework even is, is, doesn't achieve anything. It would be another disclosure that wouldn't necessarily add any value to the investors, we actually need to compare to other jurisdictions and other banks, something that's very, very tangible to be a very, to be an effective disclosure. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, James? Well, yeah. Yeah, just to change the topic, sorry, Aidan, for a moment, to that the financial claims scheme, and um, I, I guess Ian argues that it's in, in, in legal, it's not really a guarantee by in, in legal substance, but the reality is it's backed by a $20 billion budgetary allocation per declared ADI, so it has many of the, the trappings of a guarantee. Um, we're only one of a couple of OECD countries now that don't have pre-funding of a deposit guarantee. And yes, we fared well during the crisis and our asset values held up very well, particularly, particularly in the residential mortgage sector. But Aren't we therefore not a bit spoilt in not being able to think seriously about pre-funding of a, of a deposit insurance system as, a, as a, a really legitimate issue? I mean, think about the experience in the UK where um, the exposure there to Landsbanki, the um, Icelandic bank that raised deposits through a branch in the UK, and <coughs> they really had to think seriously about the structure of their deposit insurance system given the exposure of um, UK depositors to that to that incident, we've been able to skip past it, but uh, despite the obvious implications in terms of um, the potential impact on a bank's risk-taking behaviour, um, if they can kind of ignore depositor movement, depositor market discipline in making that decision. And, you know, when I woke up on the, on the 7th of December and uh, last year and was sifting through the FSI final report, um, Somebody else in another room may come up with a bigger surprise, but for me that was really the, the outstanding um, 
ex unexpected um, recommendation in the FSI final report that we maintain our our, our post um, funding of the, uh, of, of, the F of the financial claims scheme. Yeah, I, I agree because it really is one of the. Um, Aidan said generally Australia is following you know the international rules and is heavily influenced by the international trends, but it's the one area where we are distinctly out of step. And it, I must say, to me, it doesn't seem that logical that you'd fund it after the event. But do you want me to have a go? Do you want to go? You got that. Oh, you go. Well, okay. Um, let me give you my logic, and that is essentially the taxpayer. If you if you work out a fair price for the financial claims scheme. Uh, there are so many noughts after the zero before you get to something that's not a zero. Uh, you, you can't justify a fee on the basis of the cost of the taxpayer. Why is that? Well, back when we did the study of financial system guarantees in 2003, we did some calculations and at that stage the calculations were based on the assumption of depositors having preference over senior bondholders, junior bondholders, preference shares, equities and so on. And they would, the calculations there were done on the assumption that APRA would just rank equally with all uninsured depositors if it had paid out some, some, some insured deposits because the bank failed. And when you put those numbers through a, an option pricing model and so on, and you know, who trusts those, but anyway, you've got to do it somehow. Um, you know, you got figures that were so small, it was just silly to put in place something. Of course, what happened when they slipped in the financial claims scheme, that's probably not the right word for legislation, but um, APRA actually doesn't stand equal with other depositors, uninsured depositors. If there is a payout under the financial claims scheme, APRA then ranks ahead of everybody else. So all of the uninsured deposits and so on. So insured deposits of, let's say, a major bank would be, what, 30% of total liabilities old or something? something in that order of magnitude, that would mean that for there to be a situation where APRA wouldn't get all of its money back, the assets of the bank would have had to have fallen by 70%. Now, that's, I don't know if it's a Six Sigma event, but it's a, you know, it's a low probability event. Um, so it's very hard to justify an argument for the financial claim scheme <coughs> on the basis of a calculation of what is a fair uh, you know, a fair price for the insurance that's being given because the actual insurance being given to the insured depositors is being given by all the subordinate claim holders, i.e. the uninsured depositors and so on. So, you know, that's, that's my, you know, my argument for, for why you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to do it. Um, I think, you know, you, what you can mount an argument for, I think, is actually just a general tax on banks. We didn't get this in the report. Uh, yeah. On the grounds of the, <laughs> the implicit guarantee that what happens if the you know if a bank does uh, does fail, but then that's where you also hope that by increasing capital requirements, capital levels, and so on, you reduce the effect of that, and therefore you don't you don't need that that requirement. Mm. Did, did uh, you I suppose the um, bankers' association so we support the recommendation in the the in the report. Um, Basically, it's a slightly different view of it, but it's an ongoing tax on depositors. So those people today with deposits in the banks are paying this levy, and I think, I'm not quite sure in the figures, but over, it's, if it's introduced, the first 18 months it will collect three quarters of a billion. Now, so those depositors, depositors are paying it today. There's unlikely to be an activation of the scheme in the next 18 months. So they're paying for this scheme, and they will never get the benefit of it. So that goes to that insurance question again. So there is that question, those who have the benefit of it and would get their money back from a, 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 a entity in resolution, should they pay for that privilege? And the second question then is, in these economic times, should, should three quarters of a billion dollars be removed from the, from the savings of, of individuals? So it, it's not poss possibly the right economic time. But the main point is, today's depositors, depositors don't get the benefit of the scheme. It's really those in the future who have the benefit of the scheme should actually incur some of the cost. Uh, if I could just ask a question um, or, uh, or add to the, the conversation. I'm, this is, I'm speaking not as the CBA representative here, but just sort of as a, 
student of banking history and, and thinking about the U.S. where there's, a, there's been a longstanding uh, um, uh, insurance scheme. Um, the insurance fund um, did not bust. Um, and it was gathered up for many, many, many years uh, without using, being used at all. So um, it got to a point where it then got capped out all that money that then subsequently was used but not exhausted came from depositors long dead, honestly, um, for the event of, of a moment. So it was a really intergenerational transfer as it was executed in the U.S. And, and I, I think that, that historical perspective sh should be on our minds. It's highly unlikely that the people that will, even in a very slow buildup, will likely be the beneficiaries uh, in a direct sense uh, as taxpayers uh, of loss avoided, avoided. and it, it does fall really more towards the depositors and um, clearly the interest rates these days are pretty low and a lot of people are dependent upon that income. Uh, so it is, it is a kind of a regressive tax when you think about it. Who are the bank depositors? They're not necessarily high earners, high net worth individuals, so it is a regressive tax, um, unlikely to be used f for their benefit, uh, overt benefit, there's an implicit benefit along the way uh, during their lifetimes. Can I put my economist hat on and so on the one hand and on the other? I mean, I agree with, I agree with all of that, but uh, I mean, I think a, a, couple, of, a couple of points. Uh, I think you can actually mount arguments for why you might have a financial claim scheme charge, and that would go back to the point I made earlier, not very well, about implicit guarantees, that in principle what you'd expect is because of the preference arrangements, all of the subordinated creditors to depositors would, recognising that they're below the, the, the insured depositors, demand higher rates of return to provide funds to the banks. If there's an implicit guarantee from the government, if there's perceived to be an implicit guarantee, then they won't. And so you therefore could, uh, you could mount an argument to say, because of that, then there should be a, uh, or there could be, you know, there could be a, uh, a, an upfront charge uh, levied on banks for the financial claim scheme, because it's offsetting the other implicit guarantee, which means that, yeah. Um, so you can actually mount arguments for it. You could also say there is some merit in having a fund because APRA uh, may, as it, I think has done generally, if, if an organisation is in trouble, will find a way of getting it taken over. And you might have to <coughs> provide some, some funding if you know, other institutions aren't, aren't willing to do so. So you can actually mount some arguments. You can mount lots of arguments against it. Um, well, you know, like the last thing you want yeah. is a bureau bureaucrats to have a fund to play with, yeah. uh, which is one of the criticisms of the FDIC, I guess. And, 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 and another issue with the, uh, you know, the, the having a fund is that the point James made that if you do have a failure and then you've got to re uh, and you've got to put funds into it, then you've got exactly the same problem if you had a uh, a pre-funded scheme and you have a target level of funds. Because what happens is you pay out and it goes down. You've got to build it back up. Right. And you can argue the only that the only difference between a free pre-funded scheme and a post-funded scheme is whether the target level for the fund is zero in the case of a post-funded scheme or whether it's up here in the case of a pre-funded scheme. I'll say one more thing and, and then I'll shut up on this. Uh, is, and that is, I reckon this could be a, one of the recommendations the government might reject because it does have a big effect on the forward, on, on, uh, on, on the revenue estimates in the, in the, the revenue in the forward estimates. So you could imagine that, um, you know, the government might say, oh. Exactly no. what happened in the US. Sorry? Exactly what happened in the US. Is that it? the fund okay. went into the general coffers and okay. it, was, it was only available on a contingent basis. Yeah. So, yeah. I've got no reason to, you know, to, to, to say that other than, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, if I might wait one other comment, I'd often wonder what the fund would invest in because it would either lend money to the government, or if, but uh, we're a bit short on Commonwealth government bonds, or we uh, putting it on deposit with the banks wouldn't seem to be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, final opportunity for questions from the floor. Yeah, Kingsley. Yeah, I might make a, an observation that I guess leads to a question. Um, with, with the risk weights, um, you know, I think it was Alden mentioned um, 
Modigliana Miller in the context of an actual conversation. We've got a crisis on, trust me, our real ratio is 13 or 14 and not eight, and then getting the investor to, to, to step up to the plate. So the, the observation I would make is, um, of course, we all appreciate why Modigliani and, Modigliani and Miller said what they did, but um, I personally think it's probably the most dangerous idea ever to make it onto an MBA curriculum uh, because it, it pretends that the real things that matter, such as what Alden was referring to, uh, and what I've experienced in my career in the investment markets don't matter. <laughs> and that people will look past all of the things which have been assumed away in a crisis and, and, and actually pretend to play ball on the, on, on the terms described. So um, with, with that introduction, I, I guess the, I have a certain queasiness about, about risk weights. And it, it, it goes like this. The moment you decide that a mortgage is less risky than, say, a loan to a corporate. And, and that becomes enshrined in some formula, which is a fixed ratio within uh, your assessment of bank capital adequacy. Then, of course, that affects the profitability of the loans and becomes, if you will, an instruction uh, to lend more of this and less of that. And what naturally happens in the financial system, I mean, I would reduce my understanding of markets to one simple maxim. The purpose of a market is um, to give you too much of what you most wanted uh, until you have a crisis from having created too much of it. Whether it's excess capacity in manufacturing, too many housing, too many houses if you have a housing crisis, or, or frankly, too much credit in a banking system if you've incented people to create one kind of credit over another kind of credit. And in Australia, of course, um, it was observed by the inquiry that we do have a very big dependence on foreign, uh, foreign, um, if you will, um, support for, for lending and capital. And it's often been said that Australia is a consumer of capital. We don't have enough capital at home and, and therefore we, we need to borrow offshore and I accept that. But if I look at the rate of credit growth over the last two decades directed at mortgages and I look at the housing affordability situation here. I do have a certain queasiness that, that we, we may be too much looking in the rear view mirror in terms of saying mortgages are less risky than other forms of, of, of lending. And it seems to me that the policy issue there is really to frame the question accurately. Should risk weights be static or should they adjust to the mix of lending that is in the system on a system basis? Somebody want to have a go at that? Alden? Uh, yeah, a couple things. Uh, one is, um, uh, I'm glad you're defending me on the Medig Medigliani uh, Miller, which has a lot of assumptions, and, and uh, there are any number of points, um, and notwithstanding your fine paper, where, you, where you're using it in a limited way, um, that, um, th that uh, don't match up against reality. Uh, in terms of, the, um, if you had uh, two hands, therefore, uh, on one hand, a leverage ratio test where everything is treated exactly the same, therefore the cost of risk is, is deemed in your calculations as being identical to everything else. You get, I think, m a more rapid bad effect than if you have um, gradations that are not exactly accurate. Uh, so that's one point. The next point would be that they're not static because you have to prove up um, uh, your risk weights uh, based upon uh, uh, real data and renew these things periodically. So it's still hindsight, but it's a uh, hindsight uh, with um, relatively um, recently encountered terrain as opposed to distant terrain, with the exception of um, the data uh, has to cover uh, a worst case kind of scenario. So if, you, if it hasn't been in recent terrain, you have to go back and augment your database to make sure that your data upon which you refresh these estimates of risk weights uh, is sensitive to worst case outcomes. So I think there is a correction mechanism. It is still hindsight. Uh, it is the last worst crisis will be overrepresented in terms of your risk weights versus the conceivable next risk crisis. Um, in terms of mortgage risk weights, uh, and every single uh, study, b both by APRA as, and now the RBA has come out with one just, just in the papers just yesterday or the day before, um, plus our own internal stress tests, 
it shows you that um, if you're overweight mortgages because of the loss emergence period and because of other protections that you don't get any capital credit for, such as mortgage insurance, of which there's an abundance in the system, it is the least problematic asset in a normal downturn. It just takes uh, the relatively unique, it's only in, more, it's only in retail, uh, a residential property uh, crisis, which is hard to imagine you're gonna get um, unfueled by the, the global economy, the loss content of the, the corporate books and the small business books is far larger than the mortgages in those circumstances. And so you actually find that the counterweight to the crisis is the slower emergence period and a lower loss rate, even in stress, to the corporate book um, uh, because of protections of uh, low loan to value ratios, the preference for paying down because of, of tax issues, um, because of uh, the remote possibility, but nonetheless the real one, that people would tip in uh, uh, to service and not default some of their super as a, as a final safeguard to their own um, uh, protection. There's a lot of s uh, implicit and uh, explicit support for the mortgage market in the, in the form of uh, equity to support the ongoing servicing of the mortgages. So there's a lot of, yeah, and, and lastly, uh, the capital calculations should represent concentration, um, and they, they do to varying degrees across the asset categories, uh, but uh, asset uh, concentration overlays in capital models are in fact there. Okay, I'm getting a wind up. I better, better finish it there because I'm getting vigorous signs from the back of the room. So I'd like you all to join with me in thanking the speakers and the panellists for what has been a wonderful afternoon, I think. Thank you.